Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Pizza Rustica. That's right, I am very happy to be sharing this traditional Easter recipe, which a lot of people describe as an Italian meat-filled quiche. But to me, it's way closer to a savory cheesecake. So if you've ever been enjoying a slice of that, and thought to yourself, I wish this wasn't sweet, and also had salami and pepperoni in it, you are going to love this. But no matter how you describe it, it's definitely not like pizza. Although it is pretty rustica, and very, very delicious. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the dough for our crust, which will begin with some all-purpose flour, a little bit of salt, and then some very, very cold butter that we've cut in slices. And as usual, the colder the better. And then we'll also add in a couple tablespoons of olive oil, which as you can see, I'm measuring very carefully. And then what we'll do is take one of these wire pastry cutters, and we'll go ahead and blend that butter into the flour until it resembles coarse crumbs. And by the way, if you don't have one of these tools, you can just use your fingertips to rub all this together, which is how between 90 and 95% of Italian grandmothers would do it. And then what we'll do once our mixture resembles something that looks like this, is stop and make a little well in the center with a fork, into which we'll pour one beaten egg, and then we'll forculate that for about a minute, or until we think that egg is pretty well mixed in, at which point we'll stop and add the last ingredient, a splash of nice cold fresh water, and I should mention, most of the dough recipes for this call for just eggs, but I think a combo of egg water is a little easier to work with. And what we'll do is give that a very brief mixing with the fork before switching to our hands, with which we will attempt to press this into a ball of dough. And if it seems dry and it's not coming together, definitely sprinkle in some more water, like a teaspoon at a time, until it does. In fact, if I'm being completely objective, I think mine was actually a little too dry, and I could have used one more splash. But anyway, it worked. Just barely. But the point is you add enough water so it does come together nicely. And once it does come together, we can transfer that onto the tabletop to finish it off. And then what we'll do once we have manipulated that into a nice disc of dough is go ahead and wrap it in plastic and pop it in the fridge for at least an hour. All right, these type of doughs are always easier to work with once they're cold. Plus it gives our flour time to hydrate. And if you're not filming and in a big hurry, make sure you press those random crumbs I left on the table into your dough. And then what we'll do while our dough is resting in the fridge is go ahead and make our filling, which is gonna start with one pound of drained ricotta cheese. And all that means is we left it in a strainer over a bowl the night before so that any of the excess water could drip out. And not to brag, but I was using a really good one, so not much came out. But with your average supermarket variety, you're gonna be surprised just how much moisture does leak out. But anyway, we will transfer that to a nice big mixing bowl and add a half a pound of low moisture mozzarella that we've cut into small cubes. And by low moisture mozzarella, I mean inexpensive. And then the last of our cheese additions will be a couple ounces of finely grated Pecorino Romano. Or if you want some Parmesan, that is up to you. And since this is an Easter video, I think it is appropriate to say, you are after all the Jesus of your cheeses. And either would work. And then to that, we will add a little touch of salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. At which point we will add seven large beaten eggs. Okay, because six is not enough, and eight would be too many. And then once the eggs are in, it's time to meet our meats. And what I'll be adding is some cooked and crumbled Italian sausage. And I went with the sweet variety, but of course the spicy one would also work. We will also toss in some cubed up smoked ham, as well as some type of cubed up salami. And then last but not least, some pepperoni, which I basically just sliced into strips, since it came already sliced. But if you can find it in stick form, you can go ahead and cube that up just like the salami and the ham. And that's it, we'll go ahead and take a big spoon or a spatula and give this a very, very, very thorough mixing until it's extremely well combined. In fact, if you're not sure, keep stirring until you are. And then stir it for another minute. And that's it, once that's mixed, we'll go ahead and pop it in the fridge until we're ready to use it. And then the only other thing we need to prep would be a nine inch springform pan that we've rubbed with olive oil and dusted with flour. And while it is true you can cook this in other large deep baking pans or dishes, this really is what you want to use. So call your friend that does all that baking and safely borrow one from them. And that's it, once our dough's rested, we can pull it out and unwrap it and cut off about one third for the top. And we'll reserve that while we roll out the rest to fill our pan. And of course, as usual, we will only use enough flour as needed. And we're gonna to want to try to get this to about an eighth of an inch thick and hopefully about 15 inches wide. And remember when I said I thought my dough was a little dry? Right, you see how it's really splitting around the edges? 
That is one of the telltale signs. So next time I'll use a little more water. But the good news is because of the way we're going to place this in, that's not really going to matter. But what does matter is this is not sticking to the table. So I made sure that was not a problem before carefully rolling up the dough on my pin like this. And we're doing that so it's easier to transfer into our pan. And then what we need to do without stretching the dough out is tuck it into this pan so it's evenly distributed across the bottom and up the sides. And if, like me, you have too much on one side and not enough on the other, you can always pull that extra dough off and dampen it very slightly with some water and then push it into the areas where it's needed. Okay, in a perfect world, you roll that out uniformly and then placed it in absolutely centered. But you know what? I've never lived in that world. And you probably haven't either. So for people like us, we're going to have to do a little bit of patching. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. And ultimately, what we want to end up with is that dough coming up just past the edge of the pan, which I finally achieved like 10 minutes later. But anyway, once that's accomplished, we'll go ahead and transfer in our filling. And as we do this, we want to make sure there's no air pockets. So make sure you're pressing that firmly into the corners. And once that's been transferred in, we will smooth out the top. And that's it. We will take our remaining dough and roll that out into a circle that's ideally slightly wider than our pan. And then just like the bottom, we'll go ahead and roll that up on our pin and transfer it over the top. Oh, and by the way, in the written recipe, I'm going to suggest you double the dough recipe so that you have plenty to do this with. Since this amount did work, but I had like absolutely zero to spare, which can make it a little trickier and stressful, especially if you're new to baking. Okay, it's a proven scientific fact that pastries can sense fear and anxiety. But anyway, we'll go ahead and get that top crust properly positioned and pressed in, at which point we will take an egg wash and we'll give this a nice brushing. And if you're not sure what an egg wash is, it is simply one egg beaten with a teaspoon of water. And then once that surface was sufficiently moistened, I decided to take a knife and go ahead and trim off any excess, which is totally optional, but it will give us a little more uniform and cleaner edge. And once that was done, it was time to start folding our dough down from the edge with the crust from the bottom going up over the top of the top crust. And thanks to our egg wash, as we kind of push and press that together, it should seal nicely, at which point it is time to crimp, which can be a little challenging in this situation because our dough is lower than the top of the pan. In fact, I think there was even a song way back when that was called Crimpin' Ain't Easy about this very thing. So all we're really able to do is sort of go around poking, making indentations like this. Which is fine because once this is baked, it's going to look great no matter what you did to that edge. And that was actually going pretty well until for some reason I switched directions and proceeded to slice my finger open on the sharp edge of the pan. And at this point I became much less concerned with crimping and much more concerned about not getting blood on the crust. So I stopped and gave the top one last brushing with our egg wash. After which it was ready to transfer into the center of a 450 degree oven for just three seconds. Because as soon as that's in, we're going to immediately reduce our heat to 350 and let it bake for about an hour and 15 to 20 minutes or until our top is beautifully golden brown and it looks like this. And then very important, we need to let it sit just like this for 10 minutes before we carefully remove the ring. All right, so don't rush that. It needs to cool down a little bit before we proceed. All right, so let it rest for 10 minutes before you spring the ring. And if everything's gone according to plan, that crust should be a beautiful light golden brown and fully cooked all the way through. And despite the massive amount of patching I had to do, it actually looked pretty good if I do say so myself, which is why I transferred it onto a cake stand, even though I was too chicken to take off the bottom. And I took way too many pictures. But that's okay, because after you de-ring this thing, you definitely want to let it cool for about 15 minutes or so before you slice in. Otherwise, it still might be a little bit loose inside. So like I said, I let mine sit about 15 minutes before cutting out a nice big wedge, which for the first piece taken out of this went surprisingly well. And that, my friends, if you've never seen it before, is what a proper slice of pizza rustica should look like. At least according to me. And if you're wondering what it tastes like, I have some great news. It tastes exactly like what it looks like. Just an absolute embarrassment of riches of Italian meats and cheeses with just enough egg to somehow hold this all together. And of course, I'll state the obvious and tell you you can make this with whatever combination of meat and cheeses you want. Or you can add different cheeses like provolone or fontina, or different meats like copa or prosciutto, or of course, gabagool, as would several other Italian meats I can't pronounce. 
and I was just about to start telling you how nice and flaky this crust was. But you know what? When it comes to Pizza Rustica, nobody cares about the crust. It is simply here to hold all this massive amount of goodness together. And that it's fairly light and flaky and tender is just an added bonus. But anyway, that's it. My take on Pizza Rustica, which like I said earlier, is nothing like a quiche. So if you're one of these people, please stop describing it like that. Okay, it's way closer to a savory cheesecake containing dangerous quantities of meat. And whether you end up making this for your Easter Sunday celebration, or for some other occasion, special or otherwise, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a principal written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.